Delighted to welcome to the podcast former part Celtic Joey's Piemont, UCD Wade's Bordeaux, Shelburne, Ireland under 19 captain, and now Charlton defender Chloe Mustaki. Welcome to the po- podcast. How are we? Hi, guys. Thanks for uh, having me on. How are you? All good. Thanks for joining us. No, no Chloe, problem. Chloe, listen, I'd like you to tell us a little bit about how you got uh, started playing football, for example. So um, you started off with part Celtic, is that correct? That is correct. Yeah, I started, well, I started playing um, in the back garden with my brother, who's a few years older than me. And then he was playing for Park Celtics. So when I think I turned about six, uh, went down, started playing with uh, a boys team there, obviously. And yeah, ever since just been playing and enjoying it. And how did you find that starting off with Park Celtic, obviously with, with I presume you, you were the only girl there. And how, how did you find that um, environment to start off with playing football? Yeah, well, like, I think when you're that age, you don't really think about those factors. So um, I was just enjoying playing, having fun. Um, and, you know, and I still see the lads from time to time, your friends out, out and about in Dublin, which is nice. And uh, we can reminisce on, on the old days of, of playing together when we were younger. So um, no, it was fine. Like, obviously, when I got a bit older, around 13, 14, it came to the stage where usually girls kind of break away from a boys team for, like, physicality reasons. So, um, yeah, that was kind of the only reason, but I was really enjoying it there. So, and how, Where did you go then from Park? So, obviously, around the 12 or 13 mark, you wanted to join a girls team. Did you, did you move straight then to, was it Joey's, was it? Or? Yeah, so um, I think I was about 13. I moved to St. Joseph's Girls um, and started playing there and for a couple of years. And then the Women's National League was introduced when I was 16. So I was just old enough to play um so at that point I transitioned from Joey's to P Mount because Joey's Joey's were meant to enter into Women's National League and then pulled out like uh, quite last minute. So um yeah, I just decided to join P Mount because I was in secondary school like negotiating leaving certs. So P Mount was kind of the best option in terms of um managing like school and, and, and training schedule. And did you have at that point any ambitions to play professionally or were you, were you, was it kind of step by step or did you always have a kind of idea that you, this is something that you wanted to do? Um, to be quite honest, the idea of professional football was never at the forefront of my mind um, at any point. And the only reason for that was because academics was quite um, of importance in my family. So the idea was you know, get get through your leaving cert, get a degree under your belt. And at that point, if an opportun- opportunity presents itself, then go full time. And um, so that's always the way it's been. Now, obviously, the goal has always been to play, you know, to play in the senior team. And that's, you know, that's a goal that I'm still chasing to this day. And um, if a professional football contract, you know, present it, presents itself when I, you know, when I get back playing, you know, I might go down that route. But it's never been, I suppose, a life goal for me. I've always tried to balance the two and really enjoy that, you know, mental stimulation as well. And yeah, so so that's always been the idea of trying to balance the two. But as I said, the idea is really make the senior team, get a cap, at least one cap under my belt. Um, and if possible, go pro at some stage. But um, if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. And then as you were progressing through, through the ranks of Piedmont, so you, you were diagnosed with Hodgkin's disease. Can you tell us a little bit about the diagnosis itself um, and what that meant in terms of playing? Did you have to take a break from, from playing at all? Or? Yeah, so, um, so, yeah, so I was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma in August 2014. Um, so I had just come back from the semifinals uh, with the Irish team, the under-19s team. Um, so what happened was... It was luckily enough in terms of timing, it came just before going into my second year of college. So I just decided to take the full year out. And I knew I was going to have to do a six month treatment plan anyway, which would take me to about midway through semester two. So really there was just kind of no point in even trying to give it a go. Um, I wanted I wanted to give battling the illness my best shot and I didn't want to have to compromise any of my studies at the same time. So yeah, just decided to take the year out. Obviously, I couldn't play competitively because my body just wouldn't have been able to do it. Um, But as I've said in previous interviews, I kind of stayed in touch with the girls. I was up to training maybe once every few weeks, just kick a ball around. And I went and like kept up some running myself just at my own pace. Um, So yeah, so then that took me to about February or so, uh, 2015. And then I think like I was straight back into training then when I got the all clear. And I think I had my first game back against... 
Rohini or Shells, I can't even remember who they were at the time, playing for UCD, um, uh, like end of March, I think it was. So within like six weeks, I was back on the pitch as a substitute. So, uh, you know, the idea was always to try and keep some fitness and keep my mental health, uh, you know, as there as possible. Um, so, yeah. So football, despite um, after diag- the diagnosis, football was still a, a huge part of your life. You never let that side of it go, really. Not really. Like, I suppose my family and, and the doctors tried to persuade me to, you know, keep up some level of education at the same time. But I just I just knew my studies would suffer. So already that was a part of my life that I was sacrificing for that year. And there was no point of losing everything that was a part of me. So my academics and my football. So football was something that, you know, I could dip in and out of um, throughout, throughout the process, whereas my education wasn't really, was like either all go or nothing. Um, so, so yeah, I just, I wanted to keep up a part of myself and obviously football is a true love of mine and something that I've done since I was so young. So for my own mental health, it was important that I stay active and, you know, keep in touch with my football friends. So that's what I did. And how did you find that year taking off uh, college and obviously you, there, there were various treatments and stuff. How did you find that year overall for you in terms of obviously like watching, you were watching the football as opposed to playing it and, and the other side of things dealing with a, a disease like that as well? Yeah, uh, well, the first few weeks were the toughest, to be honest. Um, you know, everyone finding out, um, especially having just come off the back of my biggest, you know, biggest games in my life um, in, in the semifinals. So it was difficult for everyone finding out and people messaging me and stuff. But that, you know, at, at the end of the day, I was fine with that. I wanted people to know and to be able to talk about it openly. Um, so after the first few weeks of adjusting to, to it all, um, it was fine. It just became routine. There was no point in feeling sorry for myself. Um, you know, even as we grow older, I, you know, so many of my friends or families have been affected by cancer, you know, horrific tragedies. So it's just, just got to roll with the punches. So, um, no, it was fine. I just kind of took it on board. I had, you know, as I said in other interviews, I have really good support system around me. My family were great throughout it all. So, um, and my friends too, like I, I've said as well in previous interviews, um, UCD made it to the FAI Cup final that year in the Aviva Stadium and they they ordered Under Armour with my number on it. And when Onyo Gorman scored a, a goal, I was in the stands and they all lifted their, their jersey to show the number 17. So that was lovely touch. Um, so no, it was fine. Like I said, I had great people around me and they just kept me going. That must have meant a lot to you. And then obviously you mentioned going back playing uh, when you got the all clear. I suppose, did you have a... a, a a different or b- bigger appreciation possibly for playing football in terms of once you, you were able to go back on the pitch and got the all clear yeah absolutely I was god I was raring to go at that stage um and you know I remember in that first game back when I got when I was substituted on uh, all the players and and anyone in the stands you know clapped me on which was lovely it was lovely to see that community spirit um amongst you know the group of football players and, and everyone in the country um so it was lovely. And uh, yeah, as I said, I was raring to go. And obviously, physically, I had a way to go in terms of getting back to full fitness and, you know, being able to play a 90 minute game. But uh, my, the manager, Eileen Gleeson at the time, who's the assistant manager now at the women's t- of the Irish team, and she, you know, she knew me well at that stage. And yeah, she just eased me back into it. I was just going to ask about that. Um, how, what was your training schedule like? And were you in regular contact with people in the FEI to uh, like you said, try and get you back to that to that fitness level. Um, no, so I mean, the FAI reached out obviously uh, around the time my diagnosis, and you know, offered to provide any help that they could. But at the end of the day, the priority was just um, to get through the treatment and nothing else. So it was really up to me um, in terms of you know if I wanted, if I felt up to it, I would go out for a run. Or I got my dog around that time uh, because I was going to be spending a lot of time at home on my own. My mom was working. My brother was working as well. So we got Bella at that time. And, you know, it was just a reason for me to go out and walk her, get some exercise, get some air. Um, So there was no pressure put on me at all. And, you know, I'd be quite a driven and motivated person myself. Uh, So it was just up to me whenever I felt up to it. I, you know, I kept some fitness levels up. And then as, you know, as treatment ended, then I just kind of ramped things up um, as best as I could. And then obviously you would have gone back to college following that year out. Uh, how did you find balancing that with football uh, in terms of like your full studies as well as trying to play to as high a level as possible in football? Yeah, so I talk about that a lot. Um, I'd say the hardest part of the whole 
diagnosis, treatment um, and coming to terms with, with it all was going back to college in September. Um, you know, that whole year I was able to manage my timetable and, you know, get the sleep and rest that I needed. Whereas, you know, and then they say after chemotherapy treatment, it can take a couple of years to, you know, regain your full energy levels um, and being young and careless I suppose I thought I'd be able to you know throw myself back into to college and to high level football um so I found that extremely tough come September um the first couple of months back to college was tough you know I was it was coming to the end of the season um I was pushing myself on all fronts so definitely I remember that being a very tough period and that was actually the time where I first went to speak to someone about like the fear of recurrence I spoke to a psychologist um yeah, so at that point, I think everything came to to a, a peak, I suppose, where I had to kind of slow down and understand that my body was actually still recovering, even though it was six months post the end of my treatment. Uh, I had to really just take it easy and ease myself back into it. It almost sounds like probably the hardest part of that the whole process for you was almost coming back and having to accept that it would take a, a little bit longer than you'd like to, to come back to full fitness. It's- yeah, so I think it was just really coming to terms with the fact that, you know, I you know I was coming from a different standpoint in the sense that I had just been through a life changing event, and um, mentally and physically I had kind of ignored that fact. Um, I had you know, I had tried to pretend that you know I'd be able to go back straight away after treatment and that you know everything would be fine, but in the end my body had taken such a toll with all the treatments um that I had gotten over those six months and it just I just needed time. Um and but you know being young uh, and wanting to go out and wanting to be a part, you know, do the normal things that 19 year old, 20 year olds do, go out, you know, have fun with your friends in college, uh play games, train after a long day in college. I want to do those things when my body was just telling me like well but we slow down like you're not quite ready for this so it was tough yeah but and then moving on so you you would have um carried on with ucd um did bordeaux come afterwards in terms of that spell you had uh, away away there playing football because that was yeah. a different experience yeah so um i did international commerce in ucd which is a four-year degree and in your third year you have to do a year abroad in erasmus so so yeah i came back to college after my treatment uh, i did a second year and then in in September 2016, I went to Bordeaux for my Erasmus, um, and I chose. We had an we had an option of like a number of different schools to go to in France, but uh, I chose Bordeaux because I wanted to kind of obviously pair a good school with um, a good club. So Bordeaux was the best option for me, and luckily I got it. So so yeah, I went in in September 2016 and was there until May 2017, and just ended up playing the whole season there with the with the, the squad there. And how did you find that? Obviously, it's a change from, from UCD to go over to a, a foreign country, a, a different environment. How did you find, first of all, uh, settling into that environment and then obviously going on and, and playing the season there? Yeah, so I'm actually half French. Um, so I, I was cheating a bit in that sense. Um, so my dad, my dad lives in Paris and uh, I'm fluent in French. So in terms of getting acclimatized to both the culture and the language and everything it wasn't as difficult for me as it was for some of my classmates Um, and in terms of I suppose joining a football club there it wasn't too bad because I spoke the language you know I could understand what the girls were saying what the management was saying the only thing I had to learn was kind of um, football talk which is obviously uh, there's slang in every language for that so uh, so yeah, that was the only thing I kind of had to get used to. But in terms of, yeah, in terms of just um, moving to France, it, it wasn't that big of a deal as it might have been, you know, for, for my colleagues or for, you know, if I was moving to a different country where I didn't speak the language. So, you know, the transition was actually fine in the end. And did you find coming back to Ireland, you were a better player because because of that year away in terms of different experience, different football culture, like you said? Yeah, definitely. Um so Bordeaux, the year I, I came, Bordeaux had actually just got promoted to the first division in France. And I suppose at that stage, I wasn't too familiar with the level, the playing level in different countries. I knew obviously the division, the first division in France was good. Um, I naively thought like I would be able for it. Um, 
and knowing that Bordeaux had only just gotten promoted that year, I felt I'd be well able for, you know, to fit into the, the team there. But um, I remember going for a training session in August um, a couple of weeks before I moved over. They obviously just wanted me to come and have a look at me before getting me to sign. Um, and I was so surprised by the level, like, technically, they're so gifted over in France. Um, they just, yeah, they're just miles ahead technically than Ireland are. Physically, they're not that much further ahead, but technically they're, they're miles ahead. So that was definitely something that I had to get used to really quickly. Um, so I worked, I worked really hard that summer knowing, knowing, you know, the, the teams and the players that I was going to be coming up against in the first division, I worked really hard physically, but what was harder was just getting to grips with the technical ability of all the girls. So. Is that something that in France and, and with Bordeaux, they put an extra emphasis on in terms of your technical ability and working it and in training where compared to Ireland where it's, it's probably more uh, rigid as opposed to, you know, we don't produce, as, as so they say, we don't produce as many technical footballers? Yeah, to be honest, I don't know. I don't really know the reasoning behind the fact that in France, their technical ability is just way more advanced than ours obviously we are known as a nation for being you know work hard uh you know work hard workhorses as they say so um you know i was never going to lack in that in that regard but i i don't really know why they're so far ahead but i you know it all comes down to the money that they have over there i mean like in division two a lot of those girls are even are paid in the second division so there's just more hours more money put into it and obviously when that's the case people girls just develop quicker um so we have a long way to go here in Ireland um and I think if more money is put into the league uh you know that technical side of women's football here c- could improve so yes yeah, so you moved back to Ireland um and when where, when did the Shelburne move come about uh, in terms of after that was that post um college or yeah so I um signed for Shells uh, so I did a master's in 2018, 2019, and uh, I was on scholarship um, at UCD. So I, I had to stay there until the end of the season, 2018. And then um, when I finished my scholarship there, I decided to sign for Shells. In my opinion, Shells were the best footballing team in the country at that point. So I just, I just, I, I knew I was probably going to head to England the following season so I I just I wanted to basically play the best football I could to prepare me for that move and um, so I signed for Shells then for the 2019 season so last season basically um so I started pre-season with them in January 2019 uh so I did a month of pre-season with them but then I actually went to Lisbon the end of January 2019 to May so just over a year ago because I did a master's in international management um, in Smurfit and the second semester you have to do a semester abroad. So um, I ended up going to Lisbon. Unfortunately, I contacted a few clubs there, but they weren't really t- willing to take me on um, for, you know, for those couple of months. So I just trained really hard in the gym, like five times a week for those couple of months. And then I came back like two months after the season had started, season starts in March, um, joined back with the girls in May, and then I played May to last November with Shells. Well, that's, that's very impressive that you, you had the drive to, to, you know, train five times a week, and then it allowed you then as soon as you came back to be able to start playing again for Shells. How, how did you manage to motivate yourself, I suppose? Because it's obviously easy when you're on your own to that five times a week to turn to twice a week to once a week, and then you're, you end up doing nothing, especially with the excuse of... Uh, of a master's there as well yeah um I guess like having done a month of pre-season with the girls before I left it really I really just got that love for football again and um, the level was really good quality of players is great there at Shells management was great um and I was just loving my football there before I left so I knew what I was coming back to I knew I was coming back hopefully for the world university games in june as well last year so i knew i needed to be ready as soon as i got home to be able to like be selectable for that so i had a you know i had a few motivation points to keep me going um and like i've always been someone who needs to keep active and fit anyway so um it wasn't that difficult like uh i just put my mind to it and how hard was it then to come back in the middle of the season and join up with, with the girls at Shells and then obviously, you know, you're coming in and you want to get back into the starting, starting 11? 
Yeah, it was tough. It was tough. Like, as I said, um, really good players at Shells. Uh, I knew it would take a couple of weeks to probably break into the starting 11. Um, so I didn't play for the first two or three weeks. Um, and then, like, I just worked hard. I came back probably one of the fittest I've ever been from Lisbon, which is mad because I wasn't playing football. But I just, I ran my heart out on the treadmill most days. Um, I just came back in a really good physical uh, way. And just worked hard in training and like luckily Dave Bell is the manager there so um we you know we have a good relationship and I think he likes the way that I play so yeah just a combination of that and hard work I just was able to break into the team after a couple of weeks. And you mentioned the move to England was always on the agenda for you or a goal for you Um, how did the move to Charlton come about and in terms of it, you obviously managed to tie work moving over to London pretty much at the same time as well so that must have been a a great move for you and something you always kind of wanted to do but I suppose it, might, it was, probably was a bit of a you know okay this is really happening kind of thing as well. Yeah so the the reason so the reason I knew I was heading to London was again down to my education so um for my to validate my master's you had to do an internship abroad um and I didn't really want to go to a foreign speaking country again having just spent um semester in Lisbon so I applied for a few internships um in London and luckily I got one so I knew I was going to be spending September to November in London anyway doing the internship to finish off my master's so um to be honest like I didn't even think about what club I would be playing with until I got to London I had a lot going on I was writing my thesis during the summer I was away in Naples for the World University Games and I just had a lot going on I just knew I would get to London and I'd sort it then and um, I had one or two contacts through Dave Bell so um so yeah I got to London very beginning of September just before I started my internship and um, made a few calls and it turned out I, I hadn't even looked into it too much but obviously it turned out that all the um the like first division teams the Super League teams are full-time in England so given the fact that I was working like it wasn't even going to be a possibility to to even like look to to sign with them so um I was chatting to Matt Beard who's the West Ham manager and he said look there's no chance you'll be able to but you know I'll, get, I'll put you in touch with some of the um championship teams who train in the evenings um so at that point I just had a look at the, the different championship teams that are in and around London um and Charlton had done really well uh the season before I arrived so um it just seems like you know the right club to to have a go at so he put me in touch with Ratish, who's the manager there, and I went up, had a couple of sessions, and so so I I arrived in September, but I I had committed to shells in terms of coming home every weekend for games for two months because we were in contention for the league and for the the FAI Cup, so they said you know they would help me out in terms of um, paying for like flights to come home, and so I couldn't actually sign for Charlton until November. So I just trained with Charlton for about two months while I was coming home to finish the season with Shells. And then when I finished up in, with Shells in November, I signed for Charlton. And then I played from November to, well, March when I came home. So then bring, a, bring it on to March a little bit more and, and towards the, the ACL injury. So obviously when you're, when you're playing with Charlton, you're in, you're in the shop window for, for Irish selection. You're playing at a, at a very high standard over in England. Uh, you you get a call up to the training squad for Ireland, and then obviously that injury happened. Tell us um, a bit more about how that injury actually came about. Yeah, so um, yeah, so luckily, like my form over the summer playing for Shells and at the World University Games kind of caught the eye of of the Irish management team, obviously. And I got my first call up in October. Um, so I, like while I was kind of coming home for shells. So I had like two camps at home then. And then our next camp, yeah, this year was for the game against Greece in March. So I came home very end of February um, had a few days training in camp. And then we arrived on the Saturday in camp and then we had the game was on the Thursday and on the Wednesday training session, like with about 15 minutes to go in the training session, I just went in for a tackle um, with Heather Payne and yeah, tore my ACL. So um, world came crashing down, I suppose, pretty quickly. Uh, I knew immediately when that happened. I didn't know for sure it was my ACL, but I knew that was me gone anyway for the game tomorrow against Greece. And um, 
and for a few months at least, given the, the, the extent of the pain. So anyway, like I was doing a lot. I was pushing my body on every front. So it wasn't at the end of the day, it wasn't too surprising that something gave in, at, at, you know, at that point. But it was really, really unlucky. Like I the way that I tore my ACL was not from um, from like planting my foot. It was just really unlucky it was in the air like um combination of going in different directions which they say is really uncommon it's more unlucky to tear your acl when you're you know when your leg is like elevated than when you're planted on the floor so just in the end it was really unlucky but um i suppose as they say something has to give at some point and um yeah so here i am now but uh hopefully i'll come back you know, a better player and, and every, every elite athlete goes through tough times in terms of injuries. So this is one for me. How did you find dealing with that? I suppose, like, obviously you were, you were playing for well for child and you were, you'd been in a couple of iron caps that our Irish cap, that Irish full cap was definitely coming. Uh, how did you, you know, in the aftermath, you kind of touched on it already, but how did you, I suppose, deal with um, the reality that you were going to have a, a long spell on the sidelines? Yeah. Um, it, I mean, if you don't laugh, you'll cry. Right. So it was, it was kind of funny. Like I, as I said, I was, my schedule was insane in London. Like I was working long, you know, tough enough hours. I was training basically every evening nearly. Um, and the, the idea was really kind of just get to the end of the season um, you know, hold out until May or June and then, make a decision then like you know do you go full-time do you look for a full-time contract with you know a division one team but you can't keep this up uh so yeah it really was just hold out until the end of the season and then of course two months before then before i get to that point i tear my acl which kind of rules out obviously looking for a full-time team for another year and a half but anyway um i mean maybe everything happens for a reason and maybe you know I wasn't quite ready to make that transition anyway and I needed to to hold off and, and improve physically and tactically, which to be honest, this injury, it's a, it's a time to work on things that you, I would never have the time to work on. Um, so hopefully I'll come back, you know, better, stronger player and I can, you know, make that transition quicker um, when I am back playing. But But yeah, look, when I tore my ACL, I was, you know, I was in bits that evening. I was super upset. Um, like just two days prior to that, I had had a conversation with Vera and Eileen and they had told me like, you know, you're the closest now than you've ever been in terms of getting onto the pitch for your first cap, you know, just keep working hard. Um, and then two days later to go and tear your ACL. So look, it's, it's all fun and games, isn't it? It's a bit of a laugh. So you just, you can't take things too seriously. Um, like I was looked after really well, got surgery pretty much like three weeks after it happened, just before um, the hospitals shut down. So I've been very lucky in other ways. Um, I just have to take it on the chin and yeah, work hard to come back. It's probably, can you tell us just a little bit about what, what you were doing before on in terms of training? Because obviously you were balancing a full-time job with semi-pro in England. So and how, how hard is it that to go from training that amount of times to all of a sudden, you know, you, you did your ACL? Yeah, it was very difficult. So I, I work like nine to six um, or my working hours Monday to Friday. So I was getting up at seven. I was traveling an hour to work in the mornings and um, working nine to six, then traveling an hour to training, then training half seven to 10, then traveling an hour home. So I was getting home. I was getting up at seven. I was getting home like after 11 on a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And it got to Friday like I was a zombie like zombie land so I had no you know no energy to do anything but just go home that evening then Saturday was really all about you know getting my life in order <laughs> cleaning the house doing my shopping um, and just relaxing getting ready for a game on a Sunday and you know and that was just a repeat week after week and um, I think I went out a total of like three or four times in my seven months um, in London so you know, gives you an idea of like how little time and energy I had to spend on anything other than work or football. And how did you find going from that to obviously you came back to Dublin for that training camp and then got injured and you haven't been back since obviously you've been working from home from Dublin. But how did you find the recovery and I suppose going from that such a busy lifestyle where football and work were your two priorities to all of a sudden having that free time, I guess, but not 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 a wanted free time, obviously. 
Yeah. Well, you say not a wanted. I think, I think I needed a break. I really, really needed a break and I didn't need a nine to 12 month break with the ACL, but I needed a few months break and like just to be able to just relax and, and physically not be able to do anything was what I needed. Like my body needed to relax. Um, so the first, you know, for the first two months or so, um, you know, I was, I was quite fine with, with doing nothing. Um, but obviously towards the end of lockdown, then just like everyone else, I was going a bit crazy and I was back up on my feet then and kind of walking around and able to do stuff and able to see people. So at that stage, like come end of May, I was kind of raring, <laughs> raring to get out and do a bit of like exercise in any way that I could. Um, but for the first like six weeks or so, you know, my body was kind of just happy to relax. Um, I had been pushing it way too hard for, you know, for those seven months. So and how did the sorry sorry Sean? How did the reco- the recovery? So you've been working in Abbottstown. Um, how how are you find working? How, the, talk us through a little bit of the stages of the rehab from doing the ACL uh, in March to to when you could to start working properly on getting back. Yeah, so I had my surgery. I think it was on the twenty fifth of March. Funny how those dates uh, stick in your mind. But yeah, so I think end of March, and then I was on crutches for five weeks post op, um, which was kind of a long time, but it kind of de- on the, the I got a patella graft, so it depends on the type of ACL reconstruction you get. But the one I got was just it takes a bit longer to get back up on your feet um, after. So I was on yeah I was on crutches for about five weeks, and in those five weeks it was all about just trying to get my range back. So um, just doing exercises where I've just like leg raises, anything like that, and um, just small exercises really. Um, and then after that, I the gyms obviously weren't open until like end of end of June or something like that well Sport Ireland opened up earlier which thankfully I got access to but for the first like two months of my rehab I couldn't get access to a gym which was a bit annoying so luckily um luckily like I was able to get um a few bits of like gym equipment here and there um and I just started doing gym work at home I used like just I had like 10 kg dumbbells a 15 kg power bag and then I used like chairs anything I could use really to just, um, get my legs moving again. Uh, like I lost so much muscle bulk in my legs. Like you ask any of my friends, I would be known for having massive quads and it was just, it was insane just to see how quickly, um, my muscle bulk had gone. So, uh, yeah, so it was really just a case then of doing just small exercises, um, at home with any gym equipment I had for the first like two months, which brought me then, to about yeah beginning of June or something and then it became a bit problematic because I really needed to like build up you know move on to heavier weights so then luckily um Sport Ireland opened up earlier for elite athletes and my um the physio Catherine Fahey who's overseeing kind of my program and stuff she got on to them and asked you know could I could I use the gym um so yeah I got in there probably it's been about six weeks now and like I can see already a massive difference, you know, in in physically how I'm looking, um, a lot better, you know, building my muscle bulk back, and um, yeah, so popping into Santry every couple of weeks just to keep um an eye on on my progress. Now, just you touched there about needing a break while you're at Charlton. Is that something that you spoke with the management staff about? We're trying to manage your workload because it's a very hectic schedule, and and whether training is that some days it might be as intense as other it's still so time consuming is that something you taught us oh i to be honest i don't need i don't need this pressure of playing uh, semi-pro football or i'm thinking oh if i get rid of work out of the equation i can go full-time at it and really give it a real shot is that something that you had a real kind of dilemma about uh yeah but to be honest like a lot of girls have that dilemma at some professional level um so to be honest, when I was looking for a full-time job in December, early January, I made sure that every place that I interviewed at, that they understood um, where I was coming from and what my schedule looked like and that, you know, I couldn't work longer hours, you know, nine to six, Monday to Friday was really all I could do. Um, and even that, you know, was a push, but, you know, if you want to obviously progress in your, in your um, professional career outside of football, you need to obviously put in the time. So everywhere that I interviewed at, I was very upfront and honest and I wasn't going to, 
accept a job offer at anywhere that wasn't uh, accepting of my of my the other side of my life I suppose so um so yeah I went with a company called Maven Search um who were super super nice in the interview stage they you know were very accepting of you know of my commitments and um so you know they were they were the good option for me and ever since then they've been fantastic um in terms of just being really understanding you know when I tore my ACL I was I was only two months into the job um, working from Dublin you know I had only gotten a month's training under my belt but they've been so great and I think um you know when you're balancing work and football you really have to have a company that's understanding and thankfully they are um in terms of like from Charlton's perspective like I needed to be training Tuesday when I needed to be there at every session to make sure that I was starting at the weekend. Like the level, you know, even though it is championship, like the level of players is still quite high. Um, and I just, I was never going to risk missing out a session a week, you know, um, just to take some downtime, even though I needed it. Like I needed to be pushing myself on the football end of things as well, because I want, I needed to be playing to be, selectable for the Irish squad so um you know I, I, if I needed to Charlton would have allowed me to only do two to three sessions but it just I needed to be training so um it wasn't really an option to go to them and and say that I wouldn't be there you know one thing I've always wanted to know just moving back to the recovery um because I've been fortunate enough that I haven't haven't had an injury like like yourself how do you deal with obviously some players come back and they're the leg that they've injured is weaker, um, which is, I think, majority of the case. But sometimes people find that because they're doing so much strength on that knee, that it ends up coming back stronger. Are you working with the physio to try and make sure that you're as, um, they're both as equal as possible? Obviously, um, or how do you go about trying to do that while also doing the recovery too, as well? You know. Yeah. So, um, so basically, you kind of try. You're you're meant to do like just more sets on the affected leg. So you, you you keep working your good leg a little bit so that, you know, you're not losing any muscle and you're maybe adding a little bit, but um, it's all about really working on your affected leg and doing more sets and reps on that one. Um, at the end of the day, like a month post-op, like when I got my three months, you do like a three, a six, a three months, six months, nine months testing in Santry um, and you don't return to play on, until like the difference between the two legs is like minimal because obviously you're at risk of re-injuring it then so like at my three month test like the difference in my quads was like 48 percent or something which is massive like so like you have you have to work really hard on your um affected leg you just have to do a lot more sets and reps um until you get to a stage where they're kind of both equal and then you can you can work them both the same I feel 48% obviously so that's 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 right now but the idea is trying to get into at least single so the, the difference is minimal essentially yeah. yeah so yeah so I'll be tested again um relatively soon and hopefully though I have like improved a lot in terms of the difference between the two um but I, I think that will be the case like you know when I got that three months test I'd only been in the gym for about two weeks um so I expect to be a big difference um at my next testing Chloe, well, I definitely think that like listen to your story there. The one word that I'm thinking of is resilience. How how do you become so resilient in terms of the couple of you know the injuries you've had, the illness you've had in the past as well, um, and you seem so super focused on coming back. How do you how do you manage to be that resilient in terms of because um, there's obviously days where sometimes you know you're like oh this is just so unfortunate to happen to me. How how do you find dealing with that? Um, I'd say the main pillar in how resilient I've been, and I've mentioned this in other interviews, is um, support. Like, I've had amazing support through family, friends, significant others, everything. It's been instrumental in being able to just keep going. Um, like, I think you, the older you get, the more you see how other people around you are affected. You're not, like, I'm not the only one who's had cancer I'm not the only one who's torn an ACL. Like there's no point in feeling sorry for yourself. Everyone gets hit with different things at different stages of their life. Um, and you just have to get on with it. Like there's no other way. So, and you're just wasting your own time if you feel sorry for yourself. So, um, yeah, I think it just comes down to, uh, looking at how fortunate you are in other ways. And then, um, you know, reaching out to people around you to, for, for support and to, to keep you going. So now post lockdown, obviously football's returned. 
what's your plan now for the next six months, obviously, to try and get fit? And then are you planning to, to go back over to London and, and continue playing with Charlton? Yeah, so to be honest, right now, all I'm focused on is um, getting through my rehab. So as I said, I'm just over four months post-op now. And I don't expect really to be back playing football or contact football until um, the end of this year, beginning of next year, uh, probably beginning of next year. So um, the aim really is just keep focused on my rehab. I'm not thinking too far ahead after that. Um, I, I don't really know when my return to London will be at this point. Um, uh, I still have to, to work that out. Um, but hopefully get straight line running in, in a couple of weeks and then just build from that. Um, I, I, to be honest, I don't even know what the next stage of rehab entails, but I'm just really just focused on getting to the next stage, which is running. And then, hope, you know, hopefully I'll be there in a couple of weeks and I'll focus on whatever is involved then at that stage. And just looking ahead towards the, the future of Irish football, obviously Vera Paul's come in and there's been quite a bit of success, a few good results, a bit of a, a good buzz around the team. Obviously a few players playing at a very high level in the Women's Super League over in England. Uh, what, how do you think maybe Irish women's football has progressed in even four or five years and what Vera Paul's brought, brought to Irish football? Yeah, uh, look, I I think herself and Eileen have been a great, you know, great addition to, to the women's setup here in Ireland. I think there's great things to come for the women's national team. Um, and hopefully this campaign will be the one that, you know, uh, brings us to the Euros. So, look, there's a few games to go in our qualifiers, uh, September, October, November, I think. And we have a, f a few games left to go. Um, you know, we're definitely not there yet, but we are in a good position. So, you know, I'll be cheering the girls on and, and hopefully they can they can get there for, for my sake and then I have something to look forward to after my rehab and to work towards. So yeah, I don't know. Like I think I think there as I said, there's a long way to go still for women's football in Ireland. But um the fact that you know they're bringing in uh, more experienced management uh, to the women's side and the fact that more girls now are going over abroad to play is massive. Um, you know, I think out of the squad, like a handful of us uh, or a handful of girls were or are home based, so it just goes to show now compared to ten years ago, um, the difference, uh, the difference it makes for girls. You know, taking that leap and going abroad to play because it 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 increases the level of our national team. And right now, until until our national league gets to the same level as you know other leagues around the world, girls should be going abroad. You know, it's the best thing for them. And even if you just look at crowds, um, the crowd at the at the Greece game in Tala, and see how how far that's progressed, and, and the amount of young girls taking up football and, and going to games like that, is obviously something that there's still a lot of work to do to get the the women's national league. But the more work that can be done at 15s, 17s, 19s level, uh, is only going to help the game. Yeah, yeah. Look, I think it's amazing to see now compared to six or seven years ago when I was going to you know the women's um team games here as you know as a young player there's the crowds are in, impressive and it's just about trying to create that push in the media um and getting more people to games and showing you know what talent we have on offer even though the girls are abroad like we have such talented girls and the, you know recent results have showed that we can compete um you know europe in europe and globally so you know, if the results come and if we can qualify for the Euros, I think that'll be a major step for women's football in Ireland. Um, and it'll really improve the game and get more money pumped into the league here. Yeah, there's definitely a market, obviously, with, you know, especially looking at ladies GA, for example, and what they've done to manage to get 50, 60,000 into Crow Park, yeah. uh, Crow Park finals. Um, one final question from me. Um, you mentioned, obviously, you started playing football with Part Celtic. Uh, which was a, a boys club um, for a girl starting out playing football now at five or six, are there more options available for her to play in an all girls school, which is obviously the pre pre preferable uh, way to develop your skills growing up? Yeah, to be honest, like I actually don't really know the answer to that question. And maybe that's just because the past few years have been super busy for me in terms of developing my professional career and my soccer career. So I haven't really looked into it. I know for a fact that a lot of, you know, work has gone into grassroots football, both for boys and girls in Ireland. So I've no doubt that there are a lot more options for girls growing up, um, you know, at their younger age, younger stages now. I think, you know, I think if, you know, I was 10 years from now, if I had, a you know, a girl and I was trying to get her into football, 
or you know if I was 10 years older now sorry with with a young girl I would you know I would probably encourage her to play with a boys team for the first few years just because their technical ability is just you know it just increases higher they're playing more often than girls are you know girls don't really have that many friends who play football so you know unlike boys who are playing on the streets every day and developing quicker so um yeah I think I would always encourage a young girl um at the moment anyway to you know start playing with boys uh, and then at, you know at a later stage to make the transition it, it'll stand to her probably yeah brilliant Chloe listen you've been amazing with your time we're just going to end with a couple of quick fire questions if that's okay uh, now this, yeah. uh, as I said before uh, last week, this has turned into the not so quick fire round. So don't worry if you want to uh, expand on your answer at all. But um, what's your aside from Kevin TD Park, obviously with parts of it, what's your favourite stadium slash pitch uh, you've ever played on? Um, probably the Aviva, just because um, everyone in Ireland knows it, and it's, it's you know it's such a big stage and um, despite not having massive crowds there for the games uh, you know that's definitely game days that I'll remember for a long time uh, best teammate you've ever played with ooh god that's a difficult question <laughs> oh can I answer do I have to answer that question I don't know um, a couple of, uh, Park Celtic players here now eagerly <laughs> open for their name to be said <laughs> oh god um I look. I'll be impartial. I'll say Claire Shine. I think you know she's someone I look up to a lot, and um, good friend of mine on the Irish women's national team, and she's been through a lot as well. So, um, yeah, I, I'm going to say her. Uh, proudest achievement so far in football. Um, probably yeah, probably catching the the women's team to the European semi final. Um, yeah, I would say that's probably my my biggest achievement to date. Uh, sporting hero growing up. Oh, you've asked the wrong person now. Um, you know, I don't. I weirdly enough, I don't support any football team, which you'll be surprised to hear. But now, I growing up, I just never had the time really to follow football. So uh, all I did was kind of do my go to school, do my schoolwork, and go to training. So um, sporting hero, I don't know. I I think I. Katie Taylor is someone I really look up to as well. I think, you know, I've watched her documentary. I've met her before. I think she's an amazing person, and, you know, great female athlete to, you know, to have as a role model here in Ireland. So probably her. Well, your favourite goal you've ever scored? <laughs> um, goodness gracious. Um, I scored a header for the under-19s team um, back in the day. So uh, probably that because one, I never score and I score even less on my head. So maybe that one. And then two last ones then. So um, the your what would be your goals over the next, um, so you're getting back in, one, sorry, I know you, you mentioned you're just focused on the rehab, but what would you have a goal in mind? Obviously getting capped full, at a full international level, but have you any other goals in, in football over the next few years? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, number one would be getting an international cap. Um, and number two probably would be to get a taster of full-time football. I think I would have potential regrets if I never um, gave it a go at some stage. So, um, you know, that's probably another, you know, another goal. But as I said, it's not something that I'll be massively disappointed with if I never get to. Um, so, yeah, the two of them, maybe. And then the best advice you've ever received? Um... <laughs> I suppose when I was going through um, my treatment I'm very close with my auntie and she's kind of my second mother really and going through treatment she would have always told me um, what's that saying what doesn't break the camel's back only makes it stronger so everything that you experience in life um, while it might be tough it does make you stronger to face other challenges that you come that you come and go up against later in life so maybe that Brilliant. Chloe, listen, you've been amazing. Thanks, Emil, for coming on the podcast. No worries at all. Thank you so much for, for reaching out and, and getting me on. Thanks, Chloe.